Thank you. All right. So today we are going to be talking about nailing the customer value proposition. I'm assuming we don't need to do introductions again since this is session number four, and we've had the pleasure of doing several before this. So we're just going to jump right on in. Um, very quickly, here's the agenda we're going to go through in the next hour or so. Uh, first and foremost, we will be defining what is value proposition and also talk about why it is so important. Uh, to lay a foundation, we'll reintroduce, you'll probably recognize a couple of the methodologies that have become very pervasive throughout Silicon Valley, and we'll just sort of lay that as a foundation because it's sort of a, an iterative way of learning. And then I'm going to throw a few more definitions at you, uh, the uh, definitions of jobs to be done, and then the problems that are faced with those jobs to be done, and how we align solutions to fix those problems, and how important that is, because those are the foundations for uh, value proposition. Then I'll go through a real life example, one that I use, a very basic one, to just sort of give the context of how these definitions come together to form a value proposition. And then lastly, we'll do a very quick exercise, just how easy it could be to do a little bit more research and find out what your customer's value proposition is as it pertains to your solutions. And it's only when there's great value proposition that you actually wanna proceed with a product or service for your business. Because ultimately, if you don't have customers very excited saying they need your solution, then you might need to rethink uh, exactly what you're bringing to market. Okay, first and foremost, what is value proposition? It's, it's a very simple concept. It's the measure of consumer benefits that makes your product or service attractive to paying customers. And you'll note that I underlined paying customers. And this is an important thing to factor in because many times you'll find things that are kind of nice to have. They're often called, uh, uh, you know, not a real pain reliever, but just something nice. And if the customer's not willing to pay for it, there's not enough value to justify the existence of your company or the existence of your product. So that's very, very important to think about. So why is it so important? Um, this is a very real statistic here that over 72% of products that are launched fail to meet customers' expectations. And the important thing to note here is that this isn't for startups. This is a statistic for all businesses. So it includes huge, huge companies, companies that have a lot of money and still don't necessarily recognize or uh, achieve the, the um, uh, meeting the, the need of the customer. A good example right here on the left is something called Juicero. So this is a real product that was launched by a real company in Silicon Valley. And the idea was that, uh, you know, in so many parts of the world now, the instant coffee makers that make a single cup of coffee like the Nespresso um, or the Keurig are, you know, in so many kitchen counters and they're so convenient that this company, Juicero, was going to do the same thing for fresh squeezed juice. And so they built this beautiful device. It looks wonderful. And it, it retailed at first for over $700. And you think, oh, fresh squeezed juice, it must be complex with uh, you know, some place where you put the celery and the carrots on the top. No, you have to keep buying these little foil bags uh, that basically this machine squeezes out the foil bag and the contents go into the glass and there you have juice. And so this thing retailed for $700 at first. A little bit later, it uh, got a discount to 600 then 500 and then 350 And people weren't really buying it because you buy something that literally has rollers and just squeezes out the juice. And uh, then you have to keep buying these little foil things. It's very similar to the kind of uh, foil packets I used to buy for my kids when they were small uh, to get applesauce. And believe it or not, this company raised $127 million in Silicon Valley. And it failed to meet any customer needs or expectations or solve any problem. And in fact, it created problems for those that bought it because you had to keep buying it. It took up uh, space on the uh, 
counter in the kitchen. And ultimately this company failed in spite of $127 million being spent on it. So this is just a very, very important reminder. Spend as much time as you can to go out and ask your prospective customers what they need, what problems they have, and what their experiences are. We'll give you a little bit of an example. And uh, at the end, we'll also have some other tools that you'll be able to do your own research as well. But this is a very important concept here that the idea of what your business is might start in your head, but it needs to get validated in the marketplace. So now let's talk about some of the methodologies that have existed. And I'm sure most of you have heard of these. Um, Eric Ries has his lean startup book, which sort of became a Bible in, in the industry here in Silicon Valley. And it's a very, very simple concept. It is a concept of iterative learning. You go from an idea to building or coding and then measuring, getting data and learning. And so this was the original seminal way that we had a, a, a circular way of, of learning assessing and then doing more. And you'll notice the one little um, thing that's different from what I already told you is that it kind of jumps immediately into building without doing that market research. And that's an important distinction. So about the same time, there's a gentleman named uh, Steve Blank, a professor at UC Berkeley. I've had the pleasure of meeting him. He also teaches at Stanford. And he has a methodology called customer development. And again, it relies on an iterative process. But the important thing that's introduced here is more like the scientific method of basically introducing your hypotheses and then going out into the field, into the marketplace to test those key um, hypotheses to understand which of your ideas are valid and which ones need to be refined further so that you can actually go to market with something that has validation from the marketplace and gives you a greater confidence that you're more closely aligning your solution to the needs of the customers. Um, so like I said, it's all based on going out and doing as much customer interviews as possible, the field work and getting answers from, from them in a scientific way that you can go back and say, yes, now I have the confidence to really go in and build the product that they truly need and expect. So again, it, it's a very simple path that you go that you'll spend a lot of time in the search mode in the first box on the left. And you'll do the customer discovery and with a new set of hypotheses until you can validate that, yes, this is something that makes a customer a customer of mine that will want my product and service. And if you don't get that, this is where we recommend you pivot and go back to customer discovery. So you're doing a lot more iterative work here before you've actually you know, spent a lot of money, uh, gone into the market with a product that, that doesn't make sense. And you'll notice it's important that we use the word pivot here because in Silicon Valley, we do hear the word pivot a lot. And it's typically done in, in a lot of companies when they've launched, they didn't get the product market fit that they need. And now they're six months away from running out of money, and then they have to pivot. It's so much more beneficial to the company to focus on the pivot during that search mode. And it's only once you've gotten the customer validation that you go into the right box, the execution. You create the customers, you monetize them, and it's that monetization of the customer that ultimately begets the company building and, and the growth of the company. And of course, that's something that's attractive to investors as well. So very simple concept, but sweating the details and making sure that you spend enough time in that uh, search mode is absolutely critical. So now let's start working on a few other definitions. Uh, the next one is job. It's also called often um, jobs to be done in, in another framework, but it's basically the task your customer is trying to achieve or get done that ultimately creates the need for your solution. Um, it's, you have to think about the workflows and the activities that they go through, the obstacles they face, as well as researching um, 
what other solutions they might employ, either from another company, or maybe they have a home-brewed solution, um, especially in SaaS software. Um, you often see the solution that they're relying on right now. It's just like a spreadsheet, you know, Excel or Google Sheets or something like that. So it totally depends on what it is. In this case, uh, you know, uh, the picture shows somebody, I think, carrying big buckets of ice just over his shoulder in um, buckets. And obviously, there are better ways to do that as well. But it gives you an idea of they're trying to do something. How are they doing it? And how can you relieve some of the distress related to that? Uh, the next definition then is pain. So the pain is one sort of uh, problem that you have when you're trying to get the job done. It could be undesired costs, situations, risks. They could have bad emotions because of it. And it's anything that they experience that's negative while they're trying to do that job. And um, on the flip side, there's something also called gains. So the whole universe of problems, it's either pains that they actually experience or can your solution actually introduce gains or benefits that your customer would like, um, maybe would be surprised by. It could be functional, it could be monetary, it could be a social gain. It could be a whole realm of things, but if it makes them happy, if it puts a smile on their face, it could potentially be considered a game. So let's talk about a real life example now. So um, you'll see the picture on the right. You can see a, a woman uh, somewhere in the, the mid 20th century uh, cleaning the house. So the job here is cleaning the house and you can probably well imagine where this is going. So the product in this case is the vacuum cleaner. And so the picture you see here on the left is actually the original, it was called the carpet sweep, uh, developed and patented by uh, Daniel Hess in 1860. And um, I've done this talk a couple of times and it always seems like when I'm in the hotel somewhere in, somewhere in the world, um, I keep coming across vacuum cleaners that to this day, still look remarkably similar to the original carpet sweep of Daniel Hess from 1860. It's got the wheels on the bottom. It has a big canister. Typically it has a handle, then a long hose. And this is something where functionally, you know, it, it picks up dirt, but it really has not evolved all that much. I mean, it's been more electrified and probably has better suction, suction and so forth. But the basic device has not changed a lot. So that's the vacuum cleaner, not very exciting. So let's think about the pains that somebody experiences with using the average vacuum cleaner today. Um, these are things that I have heard in the past. Uh, you know, the vacuum can be heavy and bulky. Um, maybe the suction is not strong enough. Um, it's hard to navigate. Uh, and then another one I've heard is you cannot reach under the furniture unless you're this strong gentleman that can somehow lift up a couch. So those are the pains that we've heard. Um, I guess I will not be asking you all, but uh, let's go back immediately to gains. What would be a gain for, like just to enhance the vacuuming experience? And I have to admit, I didn't really think of too many. I said, well, gee, if I didn't have to do it, and if anybody has any other, other suggestions, certainly chime in. But uh, for now, let's just go with that. One of the big gains is I, if you could be a, a, somebody lazing on a couch and you didn't have to do it, that would certainly be a gain. So not just for a, a reminder, on the other side is the product. The product now is going to help you get that job done, satisfy the needs, and uh, uh, achieve whatever goals you have related to that. Um, we define then the feature set of the product as being either a gain creator or a pain reliever. So we're going to start with the pain reliever. So it's very specifically now the product or service and the features of them that actually very specifically alleviate some of those pains and challenges that uh, customers experience. 
and uh, just about the perfect example for a real pain reliever would be as um, hopefully everybody's familiar with the, the Dyson vacuum cleaner. And you can see here the actual, the actual feature set of the vacuum cleaner. You know, it's super, super lightweight. Um, it has something called a kinetic ball. It's a rolling ball. So it actually kind of glides over the hardwood floor. Um, another feature is that you can see it has the canister vacuum. So it's a very open funnel that sucks in the dirt. Um, they have something very unique to them called cyclonic separation. So um, it's basically, you know, some very fancy words that basically say it's this thing glides around and sucks up dirt like no other machine on the market. And then the last thing that they actually mention in their materials is something called the centrifugal force for airflow, that that whole cyclonic feature somehow creates a suck in a way that um, you can't with traditional vacuum cleaners. So it's just naturally better at relieving the pain of, of getting up the dirt and overcoming the obstacles that vacuuming people would have. Um, now, I'm going to quickly define gain creator because, again, this is a little bit of the different concept. And I like to compare it to the iPhone because I think even Apple did not really know what the iPhone was when they launched it. But uh, it really embodies to me the ultimate gain creator. And what that means is that it opened up a whole new world of things that we can do and accomplish that we didn't even realize we needed or wanted. And like I said, I don't think even Apple had any idea what um, this was actually going to be. This is, like I said, an original ad from somewhere around 2005. And you can say they, they used words like widescreen iPod revolutionary phone, breakthrough internet device, high technology. So they're kind of buzzwords and so forth. But uh, for those of you that have iPhones or, or similar like an Android phone, if you had to describe, oh my God, this is so amazing and I didn't have this you know, some years ago. And with it, I have a smart mapping app. I can uh, basically have a babysitter for my small children. Um, it is so beyond anything any of us pictured before the advent of the phone and this whole ecosystem for building the apps. So it's just a great example of a game creator for gains that we hadn't even imagined yet. And so going back now to the game creator for um, the vacuum cleaning world, this is again, an example where something was introduced that we had never even imagined. So in, in, in some ways, uh, the um, prior uh, vacuum cleaners, all just, you know, you have to still push them around. Now for the first time, the iRobot Roomba is a true game creator because it was completely self-service and it did not have to do anything um, or it did not require you to do anything. It has things like Wi-Fi and remote control so you can literally lie on your couch and just have it kind of surf around. Um, it has other intelligence built in so it actually still does a really good job without you doing anything. Auto adjustable brush height. Uh, there's something called a perimeter cleaning algorithm. It basically means that it is sniffing out like the, the dimensions of your room and figuring out exactly the pattern of how to optimize the cleaning and um, producing a good outcome time and time again, very consistently. Um, they do that of course with advanced sensors. Um, it's smart enough to auto return to your home base, which basically means it will then recharge and do it again tomorrow. So literally, you can stay on that couch as long as you want. And lastly, it even has wireless software updates. So it keeps getting smarter and better. And uh, I guess the one that we did not mention here is the fact that it even discharges the dirt back into its home base. So it truly is a self-contained thing that could uh, really make many of us much more lazy than we uh, should be. So this is typically the time when somebody says, well, you described a pain and then you described a pain reliever. Aren't those two things really just two sides of the same coin? I mean, aren't we talking about the exact same thing? And so 
Yes, but there's an important difference that if you start with the product to define the pain reliever, it is effectively a solution in search of a problem. And on the flip side, if you start with the customer's jobs, what they do, how they do it, and then the biggest challenges they face in doing it, or what are the ways that you can make it even better that they might not even imagine, then you truly discover problems that are in need of solutions, a very, very big difference. And so we encourage you to always think much more in the mindset of your target customer and see if you can truly make their lives better in a way that's better than any of your competitors out there. And it, it's a very hard exercise. And like I said, some will come within your insights and your epiphanies and the teams that you work with at your company. But then some of it will be in that dialogue with people having that challenge and that problem. And uh, that's what this next exercise will be. So this is just a reminder, what will have the bigger market demand, a solution in search of a problem or a true, true problem solver? You wanna ultimately, when you launch your product, have crowds like this that are just clamoring and fighting to get access to the, uh, the solutions and the tech that you have. So now we're gonna do something a little bit different, a value proposition exercise. And uh, hopefully enough of you have done some travel and have been able to think about the pains you experience as you are going through the travel process. So we very quickly brainstormed here, just what are the travel jobs? Going from your home to another city, what are the tasks one by one that you have to do? And I'll just go through these really quickly. Well, you have to check in and you have to track your luggage after you've checked in your luggage. You have to go through security. You have to wait in line to get on a flight. Um, you might have airport transfers if you're on a non or not on a non-stop flight. So you might have to connect and uh, switch planes. Uh, you have to wait at the luggage carousel. And then lastly, I think one of the most disorienting ones is once you've landed, how do you find your way from, let's say, the airport to your hotel? And like you go get a taxi, do you take a bus or something in between, a train? It's just, it's a little bit disorienting sometimes when you're in a new city. So I'd certainly, if anybody has any suggestions or questions, um, that that's sort of the universe of some of the core tasks, but even these could be researched further, obviously. And so just for this exercise, we're going to drill down and go deep into one specific job, which is just the checking in and tracking of luggage. And now with that, we can start talking about within that job, what are the pains there? What are the challenges that people face as they try to manage the checking in and tracking of luggage? And so I will caveat this, that these are all hypotheses right now. And we would actually need to research and have customers tell us that these are the pains that, that they are experiencing. But as a starting point, we'll just go with these pains right now. So there could be a long line at check-in. There's a long wait at the uh, carousel. Um, now the pain, the vacation gets ruined. Whoops. Does somebody need control of the screen? Or, yeah, vacation got ruined because luggage got lost. Now we're really honing in on one really, really big pain that when this happens, you kind of get in, into a little bit of a spiral. Oops, somebody controlling my screen? Is that not you advancing? No, I, I, it was moving out of time. It's very, very strange. Um, anyway, and then lastly, if your luggage is lost, we're going kind of deeper in that, we find that People complained about spending time on your phone, talking to the airlines, talking to other people, running around the airports, and ultimately looking for your luggage. So these are like real problems that we've seen 
as evidenced by people talking to us about the, the whole experience about tracking luggage. So that led us to now build a hypothesis of something called the concierge tracker. So it's taking advantage of some existing technology. It's, it's the, uh, the Apple AirTag device. And because it's a very smart device, you can basically build a concierge service around that Apple AirTag and very closely monitor the status of your luggage. And because it's traveling with the check piece of luggage, that if the check piece of luggage goes on a detour, your concierge uh, person can kind of help you navigate that. So um, let's talk about some of the features that we would say, well, this would solve the problems. Well, the feature would be that we give you the chance to sit in a lounge and have the luggage delivered to you within 30 minutes if the luggage does not get lost. So it's already a better experience because we don't make you stand there at the carousel. If the luggage is delayed, a concierge will track it down and deliver it to you elsewhere, potentially at your hotel or somewhere outside of the airport. And with it, we'll also deliver a dedicated status tracking app on your uh, phone. So you know exactly what's going on in real time. And that if there's any problems or if you have questions, a dedicated concierge is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And for those off chance moments when the luggage is actually delayed more than 12 hours or God forbid gets lost, uh, the concierge will pay you 500 US dollars to basically help you cover um, expenses since you don't have your luggage. So it's, it's a way of taking care of um, the problems that you might have when your luggage is lost. So ultimately, what are the benefits? While our hypothesis continues now, there's less stress and hassle. There's time saving because when you no longer have to stand at the carousel, you could be doing something else or you could be very comfortable and just have it delivered to you. Um, the, uh, it's easier to find the luggage when it's lost and that you're even then compensated when losses and delays happen. So again, now let's try to take these hypotheses and test it. So let's have a little market research exercise right now. If all of you could take out your phones and scan this QR code or type in this uh, link down here. And Jeff, do you mind if maybe you can grab that form? Oops the form link and then uh, yep. put it into the chat window as well. The form link, yep. Let me grab that. And let's just pause for maybe, it, it won't take you all that long. We'll, we'll just spend like, um, like two, three, four minutes on it. It's a very short survey. And if anybody has any questions right now while you're working on this form, you can certainly put those in that window as well. Everybody doing okay with the uh, survey? Uh, I think we, we can have like one more minute. Okay. Okay, let's see what kind of responses we got. 
we're going to click through to here and look at responses. We've only had one response. Hey, come on, folks, we can do a little bit more surveying. How about that? I'm still writing this survey. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good. Take some time. Yeah. And with the, uh, obviously you can just do it on your computer as well, in case you uh, don't have a phone, you can't do the QR code. Okay, well, we'll just move on ahead then. And so this is just the sample. Okay, so we've had three responses and it looks like two out of three said, yes, they would want it. Again, you know, you can be honest, it does not matter. Um, we also asked, would you prefer to pay annually and, uh, or would you like to do it on a per trip basis? And oh, it's going up, now it's 50-50. And we also quizzed on the benefits. Um, nobody saw the money savings. There's a little bit of the time savings, 80% of stress and hassle. And then we even started asking now, how much would we pay per trip for this service? And so it looks like it would be $5. On the per trip some, basis. And then some people said, a third said $10, but two thirds said $5. So what that means is, oh, we're even going a little, a very generous spender. <laughs> and then for annual, you can see the pricing there. And so, 71% said, yes, they want it. Okay. So obviously this is not a real product. This was, oh, it keeps growing. <laughs> Getting nine responses. Okay, well, we'll go back. The important thing is not the, the results. This is obviously not a real thing, but um, let me actually open this up and you can put this in the chat window. Um, what did you notice about this survey? Anything jump out at you that was kind of unique or different? Via this survey, you, you know what customer wants. Okay, good, good. Anything else that you noticed? Well, one important thing that you'll notice is this is at the idea stage. There's no product, no MVP, and it was just an idea. So I literally just used my words to describe something. I lifted some art from somewhere else, um, and I just got feedback. I, I will caveat that the questions I asked are not necessarily the questions I would ask in a real market research survey. You would want to understand the demand for it, would want to understand some estimates of willingness to pay money. So you got the gist of it, 
but there could be a lot more elaborate ways of asking that. But the important thing is we got that information with just an idea. And so in this exercise, I'm trying to nail value proposition before I you know, spent one nickel on uh, writing code or developing a product. And this then kicks off that iterative cycle of testing and validating an idea. Um, one of the other things I'll eventually want to validate is, okay, well, uh, two thirds of the people only want to pay $5 per trip. Um, and then, uh, one third want to pay ten dollars. So the average is, you know, six seven dollars. Um, is that a viable business? And that is part of the research as well. Is just to confirm that whatever the demand for the product is, the valuation that's put on it, it's enough to justify the existence of that product. And we probably have not accomplished that, given that you need an air tag and they're, you know, they cost some money, and then you have to have, you know, insurance and this and that. Uh, but you're getting data that you can start testing and validating those hypotheses. The wonderful thing is it's easy and cheap to do. I just got probably about a dozen responses just in a very casual conversation. I used Google Forms and I could repeat and do that over and over and over, refining the model, refining the solution and getting more and better data. And it's all about that data that you can generate. And now this methodology, you can test with, like I said, a written description, and that's the cheapest. You can make it a little bit better using mock-ups or wireframes. If you have like an online product, you can do a graphic design or an illustration if you have a hardware. Um, there are lots of ways you can richly convey it. You can produce videos, for example, and then have people react to videos. And uh, you know, finding cheap ways to do any of those is absolutely key. But then lastly, would be to do the MVP and the product concurrent as well. And sometimes you have to develop product because it's a very complex thing. Um, you know, if you were to test out the iPhone, uh, you know, if you're Apple in the year 2005, it'd be a little bit hard to like kind of hold up the phone illustration and really have people express interest. So sometimes it does call for some level of MVP. But again, have the product be commensurate with maximizing the learning and de-risking the company as much as possible. And so let's see, how are we on time? We left a little time because I know we also want to talk about uh, pip, uh, pitch prep, but um, get this URL, get the QR code or the uh, tiny URL link down here at the bottom. Um, you can register and get a um, customer discovery and value proposition bundle, we call it. So it goes into more details to explain how to do the surveying. Um, uh, there's something called trigger questions ways that you can ask things to spur dialogue with the consumer about their jobs and their pains and their gains and so forth. And it's an excellent way of just getting started with some best practices and just to start with some templates that can help you do that. So go ahead and grab that. And with that, I will have one last parting question for you. Are you doing enough to measure your customer's value proposition as they see it while they're using your solution and trying to get that job done? So this is just an absolute thing and, and do not ever believe that you do this once and then you set off on, on the company. The market research will be an ongoing part of your business. You will continually refine your solution you will introduce other solutions that might be complementary. You might be going into different segments that have different needs and different expectations and therefore their value propositions will be different. So just think as the, the research that you do is gonna be an integral part of refining your product for years to come. And now, um, we wanted to leave time. So Jeff, would you like to chat a little about the, um, the story flow document? Sure. So 
one of the things we want to make sure as you guys are finalizing your pitches and getting ready for your demo day is that you really have a very compelling story. When you talk about a pitch, all you're really doing is using the pitch to tell your story. Now, we have an outline of the story. It's at the same URL um, that the other um, customer discovery tools are, are at down at the same bottom. So I'm not going to put a new link in the uh, chat window. It's the same one. And that back um, document in the middle that says storyboard framework for startup pitch deck is an available document. And it helps walk you through which slides you should have. It's targeted primarily at around a seven minute pitch. I don't know how long is the uh, pitch on your demo day? Uh, how long do you guys have for your pitches? Five minutes. Okay, thanks, Shuki. So it would be a little bit, you'd, you'd have to cut down one or two slides. But basically, you want to start with the problem and the solution. As Cal's walk through, helping really identify a true pain point. Um, it can't be something that's not a real problem that people can relate to. One of the recommendations is to use a persona. Talk about the problem by introducing a person who's experiencing challenges. That way people can relate to that problem because they may think, oh, I'm just like that person or my spouse or my partner or my cousin or my sibling is just like that person. And so they can easily relate to the problem because you framed it in the way a person is experiencing the challenges. And that might be much more relatable than just conceptually describing the problem. So this framework will walk you through each slide. I don't want to go through all the detail here. You can do that at your leisure. But the whole idea is that this will give you a framework for telling a very compelling and relatable story. And at the end of the day, people really need to connect and relate to your, your problem and solution, the product market fit, and all the advantages, the value proposition, as Cal spoke at length about today, and all the other elements listed over here on the left. So we invite you to download that document and... Um, Hopefully, it'll help inspire some of your uh, pitch decks as you're putting them together in advance of the uh, demo day. And we are happy if there are specific questions. We are more than happy to take any questions you guys might have. Yeah, um, so please feel free to raise your hand or write your question in the chat box. And we could go into it. We have a few more slides on pitch that uh, I know we have a little bit of time here, which is wonderful. Um, and we can go through exactly uh, how we like to think of uh, some best practices related to pitch prep. But uh, if there are value proposition questions, we're happy to chat about those before we jump back into the pitch stuff. Now let's see if we have any questions, but it seems like um, at the moment we're good. Okay, well, why don't we uh, let me find with me. Uh, we do have one question coming now. Okay. I see it here. I'll just read it out loud here for Cal and everybody. I want to know how to price my services. I find it difficult because I'm in a country that is not the country of my target customers. I don't know the economic situation in Central Asian countries, and I don't know how much my customers are willing to spend. I did market research, but very few people answered. Maybe to give us context, can you describe your product? Tell us what it is. Yeah, what is your product or your service, just at a high level? Um, I want to create a, a game about fitness and um, because uh, I do the um, custom research and uh, only eight people uh, write down the survey, but uh, seven of them uh, think it's not a good idea. So I try to uh, re refit um, to... Um, uh, cover my uh, document and improve my idea. And I now I have another new idea. So 
I I think it's a it's a little difficult for me to uh, know how much is the customers can um uh, well 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 have have well to pay the money and um actually I don't know um the the game um. Um, the game uh, in industry. I'm sorry. I'm 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 feel a little nervous. You're doing just okay. you're doing okay, just, you're doing doing just fine. You're doing wonderful. Um. So, uh, yeah. Uh, can Can you uh uh, uh re reply my answer first, please? Yeah. So let Let's start sure. with. So it's. The problem that's being solved in this case is um, people know they're supposed to work out, but they don't want to work out. Is that what you would say is the, the problem? Yeah, because um, they they maybe have a lot of um, I uh, a lot of problems to do some sport because uh, they have no time or mm -hmm. they just feel lazy or although they do some exercise, but they didn't see the well, um, 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 good, good impression. Yeah. Like the results of their exercise. Um, uh, I, I want to uh, make a game like, um, the switch, switch like the, the most um popular game do you know what what the game is oh, i think you muted jeff the name of the game is called switch um no it, it, it means a uh, ring fit adventure do you know this game i'm not familiar with it I'm not familiar um, with that particular game. Ring Fit Adventure. I see it. It's on the Nintendo Switch on the platform. Yeah, yeah. It's a very a popular game, and many, uh, so uh, many countries people to uh, play this game. So I think, uh, but I can't find the uh, data about uh, Asia, um, Central Asia people. So um, although I, I, um. Uh, invite my um, team, team, my my team to invite their friends to uh, write this um, survey, but it's not a good, <laughs> yeah. So you want to so, build something that? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. Go ahead, Cal. Yeah. So you're trying to build something that's inspired by that and still achieve some results exercise-wise with cardio and, and yeah. so forth. I want to create a, a game character to accompany um, users to sport. And then do they do it out in the physical world, like with augmented reality or something like that? Or is it like fitness in front of a, a game console? Um. I want to create like this, um, like, um, um, I, I, I want to research some pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think the other thing that's important is, um, and again, we within the hour that we, we don't have enough time, is who are the people that most have the problem? And so I think the the problem that you're trying to solve is, making fitness more fun you you gamify fitness and so you have to find when you think about how you segment the market what what's the user persona there's something that you can build up your your dream customer and it's that profile of your dream customer that you sort of have always in your head that this is the person that i want to build the, the product for and yeah. so with the eight people that you interviewed did you already think, well, it could be college students because they're too busy, but they like to play games and they also want to work out. They just don't have time. And yeah. so 
that's where, you know, like in my example, it was travelers. And if, if I spent more time, I'd say, well, it's maybe not student travelers, it's business travelers for whom time is more valuable and they're willing to pay more to have this concierge. So the, the iterative process that we're talking about is thinking, um, you talk to eight people, one out of eight loved it or something like that. And it's like, what were the unique characteristics of the person or the people that loved it? And then you could do a little bit more digging and saying, okay, what did they have in common with this other group of people? Oh, well, there's, you know, busy students. I'll interview entirely students next time. And then it is hard to do the surveying and, and getting responses, um, especially when you're bootstrapping. Um, I always encourage you not to rely on your friends and family because, you know, your mother would undoubtedly give you an excellent review and love you. So you have to find groups and, you know, through social media, where do people congregate that either, you know, love games or love exercise or talk about that they wish they exercised more? And could you tap into you know, in our country, it might be Facebook or, you know, Twitter or Reddit, where you can find communities and groups that sort of start getting more aligned with what you're looking to offer. Yeah. So those are some thoughts. I, I don't know if that, if that still leaves any other thoughts or questions on your part. I get it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have questions on value proposition? Anybody else have done market research already or talked to prospective customers? Um, I think most of the team have done market research. Just like that's uh, the first task given okay. to the students, yeah. Okay, anybody have any good insights? Did anybody already uncover a good value proposition that made them say, wow, this is amazing? I, and but mind you, Investors love to hear those early stories of, of traction. This is traction when you found an unmet need in the marketplace. And that's what this whole exercise is about. I see we have a comment. We've done a transport sharing project, which means our customers are not only the people, but also the local government. How to ensure government support? Um, um. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to expand a bit on this. One of our um, guiding question is about right sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, we're talking about right sharing and how to receive government support for right sharing because this yeah. is kind of some of the issue in China. I don't know about other country, but perhaps yeah. yeah. Um, we coincidentally just worked with the ride sharing company from Korea. This was at, at UC Berkeley. We just did a program and and. Um, this is, I'm glad this one came up because we just had to deal with this. So then you, again, think about the problems that the government has, and not just the government as a whole, but people within the government that are trying to solve certain things. So who are the people within the government that are responsible for urban planning, that are actually thinking about traffic on the roads, traffic jams, um, enforcement, you know, law enforcement, if, you know, accidents happen and things like that. And so if you come with a program that says, I'm going to remove during rush hour, 20% of the traffic on the roads, and therefore the commute from the downtown work area to the suburbs will be reduced by 20%. And, and uh, you know, all these benefits will happen. Um, again, you have to be very surgical about thinking, who is most experiencing the pain or the problem and that you've identified the pain or the problem. Um, going back to the example of the, um, the, the team that we just worked with, they were actually looking at it from the problem of climate change. And so there are marketplaces, you know, where that have, you know, these carbon credits where you can trade in that. And if you achieve fewer gas polluting cars on the road, you can actually measure, you know, how much of a reduction in carbon dioxide into the air. And now with these marketplaces, there's actually a measured value, you know, it depends on the country, I suppose. But again, 
some governments are managing to that as well, is that they have a certain responsibility to take a certain number of cars off the road and to reduce pollution. So um, each of those might be a different person in government that's dealing with one problem or the other. And they might be the ones that get excited when you present a solution that sort of directly aligns to that. And then you, know, you can present the hypothesis and do the market research. Does that help? We can also talk very briefly, uh, contacting someone in government who's in charge of traffic. That's from me. That's a response oh, okay. back to the person. Perfect. Anything else to add then, Jeff? Uh, I just, I put it in writing just while you were sharing your thoughts, so just that you could contact somebody in the government who's in charge of traffic and helping to alleviate or, or make traffic less challenging for the commuters. And certainly bigger cities suffer from this this challenge all over the world. Um, so this is a global problem. Here in the Silicon Valley area, our local government offers incentives for commuters to ride share or to take public transportation, public rail, public buses. They offer discounts. They offer conveniences, um, other perks. I called it perks, other incentives to you know, encourage and create an, an, um, enthusiasm for people to want to ride share. Um, and so, you know, if you said to me that you'll be in less traffic as maybe you have a carpool lane. So you're in the lane that's moving faster because you're in a lane with multiple people rather than in the single, you know, uh, commuters lanes. Um, that's an incentive, maybe a toll, like on a toll road, if you have to pay a toll is lower for people commuting together and ride sharing. So the government can really play a strong role in helping to create incentives for people to try to pair up and do ride sharing so that they get less cars on the road. And it's worth it to them. It also, to Cal's point, it can create a much lower carbon footprint. So the air quality would be better in the cities where there's less vehicles driving, less traffic means it's probably safer for others on the road, not just other vehicles, but pedestrians. So I think you'd have to try to find somebody in government who's in charge um, or in the area of government involved with maintaining traffic and roads and things of that sort. So I would encourage you to look there and then see if you can uh, ask them some informational kind of questions. Just tell them about what your plan is and ask them what kinds of incentives the government might or, or support the government might be able to provide um, to encourage people to use the ride sharing. I hope that helps and makes all, I hope all that makes sense. Question about market size. Oh, I love market size. Okay. So should our team consider market size on a global level or should we narrow it down to only Central Asia as the problem statement our team chose is category one from Karak challenge that emphasizes the health tech solution for Central Asian region. However, our solution is not just limited to the Central Asian region. So I'm assuming that you've, you, you know the acronyms CAM, SAM, and SOM. So total addressable market, serviceable addressable market, and then lastly, serviceable obtainable market. That's how we kind of break down and generally are the pitch decks we see often have three different market sizing. And so the TAM and the SAM are total addressable market, which tend to be really, really, really big, big numbers. And you know, you could say I could, this solution could work. Every person, man, woman, and child on the face of the earth would love this. And it's a really big number. And it's something, it's a calculation that's top down. It, it's expressed as, you know, somebody else did a study and it's billions of dollars. My favorite number, and I bet Jeff would agree with me, is actually SOM, serviceable obtainable market, because it's the one that we always ask, think from the bottom up. Think small, think about your first market entry, think about the team that you have, the resources that you have, the ability to go to market. And that's the one that frankly, even investors will care about the most because that's the one that's a direct measure of what you truly can accomplish. And again, using market research and using some customer discovery you can talk about within one region, either a country or a city, Maybe it's a segment of, of the population. Maybe it's health tech. So maybe it's all people in, in a certain city. But 
the, they'll ask you, the investors will ask, how will you reach customers? How will you actually make them aware of your solution and talk them into opening up their wallets and giving you money? And that's best done for SOM, bottoms up, because yeah, we hate seeing pitch decks that say, well, the TAM is 10 billion. And if we only get 1% of the market, then we're golden. Show us that you've done some exercise from the bottom up. Does that help? Jeff, would you have anything to add? Yeah, I think, I think I'll add something here. You know, the one thing to realize, the question is really about, should you just present market size for Central Asia? Because that's what the, the category from the Karak Challenge is addressing. Or should you address the market size for the globe? because maybe your solution has global opportunity. So there's something, and we do also talk about in the storyboard framework called a beachhead market. The beachhead market is your initial market uh, point of entry. So you may say that Central Asia is your initial market, even though the global, so I might have the TAM as the global number, the serviceable addressable market, you could say maybe is all of Central Asia and some might be one country that you're going to initially launch in. And anything with health tech is going to sometimes run into different regulatory issues in different countries. So it would be very difficult for you to enter multiple countries and certainly multiple regions um, right at the beginning when you first launch because there's so much you'd have to deal with in the united states you would have to go get fda approval for uh, many health tech or medical technology solutions so even going through that process in the united states which is even different than canada and different than mexico in north america so i would encourage you to put the tam maybe as the global opportunity for your market size but the sam would be maybe the carrick region and then um the SOM would be the first country. What I'm going to say is maybe your beachhead market. Hopefully that helps a little bit. And Thank I think so to much. Shuki's, yeah, I think Shuki, to your <laughs> point, investors love solutions that are scalable beyond borders, as we like to say. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great you know, challenge to have is, is my market too big? That's not such a bad thing for, you know, sharing with investors. That would be welcomed. But I think to Cal's point, you really have to show that you know how to go get clients and get customers. That's going to be the most important part. And it's it's very difficult if you say, like Cal's example, the market's a $10 billion market and all we need is 1% and we'll be a $100 million company. That's very lazy way of calculating your market size. You have to say the market's 10 billion, we're going to focus in this region, which is a fraction of that. And here is how we're going to go get our first customers. And we think in the next few years, we can obtain X dollars of revenue, X, X millions of dollars, maybe, if it's a big enough market. So be, be very cautious about describing how you're going to get the, the group of customers that fall into your SOM, your obtainable market. And again, Similar to these other things, these are um, topics that are referenced in the framework, uh, storyboard framework document that we've provided for you guys. Any other questions? Anybody having uh, questions or concerns about getting ready for the pitch or best practices with the pitch? Um, sorry, uh, just a question. Uh, are we still going to have some more uh, training on on pitch? Or um, I, if we have time, we're happy to jump into a few more slides. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Let's see where is we'll it? touch on that that question about mistakes or pitfalls to avoid when creating the pitch deck. That again is something you can um, have covered in the uh, some ideas at least covered in that storyboard framework so please i i can't encourage you guys enough go grab that document um it really will give you some very good tips on how to tell a very compelling story but cal will go through a few specific ones here yeah so um we call this one seven investor pitch tips for the TikTok era i imagine many of you have probably been on 
TikTok, and uh, I can tell you my, my kids certainly have. Um, and it, it is relevant and important because we do see a lot of parallels between wowing an audience of investors and getting engagement on TikTok. And so frankly, it, it's short format. TikTok's a little bit shorter, but five minutes is really short too, because you're trying to summarize your entire business model and all the details behind it in five minutes. So it, it's pretty short format. And Unfortunately, lots of investors that we know are every bit as short attention span as kids like on TikTok or other social media. I can tell you firsthand from my experience, it is one of the worst feelings in the world when you're pitching to an angel group or a, you know, a big audience and you suddenly see some people in the audience that you know pick up their phone and they start doing this and you're like, hey, you're supposed to pay attention to me but you can't help it. And in that moment, you're kind of stuck, but there are things you can do to basically get them engaged as quickly as possible. So it's critical that you engage them immediately and otherwise they're gonna swipe and move on. And, and there are a, a number of things we can do about like, how do you get to a lot of small wows on each slide that you keep them engaged and keep telling the story? So, the, the storyboard uh, that Jeff has just shared basically says, you know, one topic per slide, it's 11 topics, so 11 slides. Like, oh my God, 11 slides in five minutes? Maybe we can work down to maybe it's just eight or something like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you have five minutes to pitch, let's say you do have 11 things to share in five minutes. And that's just 27 seconds a slide. So think about how quickly 27 seconds go by. But we think you can do it because 27 seconds is really close to the average time that a TV commercial is. And somehow a TV commercial convinces me in 27 or 30 seconds that I need a soda or I need a new deodorant or something like that. So think about how you tell a story like a commercial. And your only objective should be, you're not trying to teach them about every aspect of your business. You just wanna get the audience to think, wow, that's interesting. I want to hear more. That's all you can accomplish. So what are all those wows you can get slide by slide in 27 seconds or less? So the seven tips that we tell people to think about First of all, start to tell a story about a person. A user persona is what they're called. People are relatable, um, very important. Avoid wordy slides, make it much more visual and just don't have a lot of uh, words on your slides. Um, prepare your talking script every bit as much as your content on the slides. The words coming out of your mouth are really important. Um, use good imagery that convey what you're trying to convey. Uh, spend some time or effort to make the deck pretty. Uh, use big, legible fonts. And then lastly, project yourself. Be up there like a CEO, convincing an audience that you have the vision for the company. So I don't know how we're doing on time. I'm going to go quickly. So the telling a story thing is really important. It's in introducing someone or something in the real world that's relevant and compelling to the user's experience and how your solution becomes relevant. And you can use some very, very classic story arcs, you know, once upon a time, a day in the life, imagine if you will. Um, these basically set the stage. So let's say we're talking about, you know, traffic problems in, in a city and you introduce the person who's mainly being you know, having their problem solved. It could be a government official that's spreading about traffic jams and accidents and, and smog, or it could be a person sitting in a car. As soon as you introduce that person, we're relating already. We're already thinking, oh my God, I kind of understand what that person is going through. Um, and it's amazing how the story arc follows very closely to, you know, Hollywood filmmaking, the person being rescued as the user persona, the villain is the problem, 
the hero is the solution or the value value proposition or the team potentially. And, um, you know, the rest of the story kind of comes together. And ultimately, there's the climactic finish at the end, the traction in the ask. And literally, you can make a deal film it. Um, we'll give you this deck later, but there are a bunch of videos you can watch. Um, this is a, uh, a wonderful uh, demo day that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, but they are very focused on another methodology called human-centered design and thinking about how you talk about people. And you can literally see the personas here in the upper right, you know, Renee from Las Vegas. So they have a real person that they're telling the story about. Um, quickly put this up. Nobody is going to read stuff. The problem is when you have that many words on it, if you're trying to read this right now, you're not paying attention to me. And if you're paying attention to me, you can't read that. So there has to be a good balance between the words on the slides and what the presenter is saying. So how wordy was the last slide? What was the optimal word count? What was your wordiest slide? So first of all, those first two things were in the deck on the prior one. We'll, we'll skip that now, but it's a good reminder that you probably missed some really important uh, language in the on the slide because you just couldn't get to it and and we see it all the time that somebody panics because they want to they have so many things to say about your company and they just don't have the time so believe it or not um 20 seconds allows 90 words to be read but people can listen and scan and they cannot listen and read it's just a, a limitation of the human behavior so this slide only has 27 words and within the time that I budgeted to tell this, you probably were able to scan and uh, keep up with me as well. So the rule of thumb is don't ever have more than 30 words on a slide if you're trying to make it fit. Um, and less is better. I mean, if you can just get away with a picture, fantastic. Um, we encourage you to write out your talking script. Um, depending on where you are in the world, some people talk at about 150 words a minute. So, um, but if you're average in 27 seconds, you can say about 68 words. So that's a good rule of thumb, just to remind you how many words you can get out on a specific slide. So no more than 65 spoken words per slide. Um, I'm gonna skip this. This is another more complex tool. We'll stick with the story flow guide that Jeff had shared. This is part of our accelerator. Um, we generally say don't use a teleprompter unless you really, really need to, unless there's a compelling reason. Um, we've seen people, you know, hold their phones like this. That, that doesn't look good. There's a way you can use a teleprompter app on your phone or on your iPad, and um, but practice. Um, generally speaking, um, on that last point, I like to speak from the heart, so I know the bullet points I'm trying to get across, and then it seems a little bit more genuine than just reading off a script. Um, just a strong reminder, images complement the story. If you're selling aspirin, do you show the pill or do you show the person with the headache? And again, we can relate much more to the patient. Um, there's a stronger emotional connection, and I'm going to show on the next slide, this is just amazing. The, the power of the emotional connection for when you see a person. So diagnostic accuracy in CT scans, these are brain scans, get better by 46% when the technician was shown a picture of the patient. Um, so of all the diagnoses, the ones with the pictures ended up being 80% of the diagnoses it reminds the technician of what's at stake. There's a real human being at stake and they develop much more empathy for it. They literally think, oh my goodness, my grandmother is, is uh, the patient here. So that's how powerful the emotional connection could be with a particular picture. Um, there are places that you can go out and get um, pitch deck done for you. And if you don't have the budget, there are lots of pitch deck builder tools right now. And now is the best time ever. Now with a chat GPT, 
there are more and more free deck builders and picture creators and lots of great free resources. There's literally never been a better time to make your pitch decks absolutely uh, amazing on a bare bones budget. Um, we always remind people to use a, at least a 30 point font, make it legible. Um, Jeff and I are a little bit older. Um, I'm wearing glasses. Our eyes are not as good. So don't make us work hard to try to absorb the information on the deck. And then lastly, it's projecting yourself. And there's something called the Superman or the Superwoman pose, where if you just go into this position, I don't know if you, I can't see myself, but the way she's holding herself, it, it first of all, blood rushes through your body, you feel more confident, and you are putting forth a, uh, what's called the power pose, that you just are, are more in control with the engagement of the audience. So think about your engagement, think about the eye contact with the audience, if it's live and in person, Think about varying your tones. You want to basically, you know, talk high, talk low, and show emotion and energy. Um, use your hands is okay. I was just doing that. Um, I'm guilty of this. I sometimes say um because I'm thinking. But uh, in spite of that, I will still remind you: don't say ums or you knows. Uh, I think that's more a, a common American practice. Mm -hmm. And then this is the story flow guide. And that is it. So we certainly well, welcome any feedback. I went very quickly it, here, but lots to share here. And I wouldn't mind, Shuki, tell me if I have a, another lady two minutes. I want to show a real example. I'm helping two companies right now with five minute pitches for a pitch coming up one week. Yeah, uh, sure. yeah one week from today. I'll I'll actually share one of them. I don't think the gentleman would mind. Um, and you guys can see my screen, right? This is for something called Lloyd's Lab, but it's an insurance company out of London. And the company that's presenting is called Lodestar. You see the top up here. We always recommend putting a little bit of a descriptor. What does your company do? People want to know on this slide, can I understand what the company does? And to Cal's point, does it seem interesting that makes me want to know more? And so then you would go into the next slide. And again, pay attention to the visuals that are gonna show up here because this is something that's important. And notice also a little bit of animation. One way to deliver a presentation is through animation. I will tell you a little bit about the ships that are coming into the United States from Asia. There's 15 million of them. 100% of those are subject to inspection. You can see the way I'm slowly rolling out the story. The bullets help me tell my story because I can actually trigger my thoughts when I see the bullet, or maybe I know my story and the bullet supports my thought. So you can lay these out to remind yourself, but notice how few words are actually on the slides. They're not heavy. What I would speak to this slide, if I was the presenter, would be different than only the words you're seeing, but the words either trigger me or they support what I'm saying. So I, I just want to show that. And then one other thing I want to show you is, let me uh, stop the share and then I'll reshare. I want to show you one other thing. You know, to Cal's point about creating beautiful slides, I opened a new slide here and I typed the words business plan. And you'll notice over here in, in a later version of PowerPoint, if you hit the designer button, you get all these choices. Some of them have wonderful animation, so I could click that, and that's my new cover slide. All I typed was the words business plan, and that design gave me a few choices to choose from. And if I don't like those, I can click this button and even get a few more design options and scroll down. And maybe I say, no, what? you know what? I like the look of this one. It has a good feel. Now when I add a new slide over here, if I add up, oh, let me uh, go back, hang on. I, let me if I add a new slide, it's in the format of that new design. It keeps it for me. So I don't have to do too much creativity. But if I put um, market size and I enter something, I can click the designer button and it'll start to show me market size. So maybe I'm going to talk about the market size. And I think, oh, good, the numbers are important here. 
or maybe I'm selling vegetables and fruit. And so I'll talk about the market size. So it really is a helpful tool built into PowerPoint to help you bring visuals. And in some cases like this, the one that we started with up here, it'll even have some animations potentially that really bring your presentation to life in a way that you don't have to struggle with, oh my gosh, how am I going to make this really pretty? These tools really can help you quite a bit. So I just wanted to share those as a couple of quick examples of using the animations and using the, the, the um, it's AI driven designer feature inside of PowerPoint. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And I agree with it. I use it a lot, that PowerPoint yeah. function. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, before we go into your final Q&A session, uh, of course, you can start preparing your questions, anything related to pitching deck. Um, I have a few slides to share, something that I didn't share at the beginning because of yeah. some technical issue. Yeah, so just very quickly. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Yes, perfect. So we're now in week six. Um, this week we're doing competitive advantages uh, of your solution and we're preparing for the pitch deck. And of course, we also have this workshop on customer value proposition. And next week uh, we'll be preparing for the pitching. So uh, you'll be recording a five minute uh, a uh, a video and upload to the platform. And on Friday, next Friday, we'll be having a mock, mock uh, pitching day. Yeah, in fact, I have a better slide to show this. So um, next Friday, we'll be having a mock pitching and mentorship session. And this is mandatory for all the students. I will send email reminder again. And each team will have five minutes to present and three minutes for a Q&A and feedback. So um, please prepare for the for the mock pitching, and it, it's also a good opportunity to hear other teams' presentation to know how other teams is doing. And on uh, 29th of March is our final pitching day. Uh, so ten teams will be selected to pitch their ideas and solutions. And I'm sure the, the pitching tips that Jeff and Carl just shared are very, very helpful. So uh, we'll be sharing the presentation. So yeah, uh, please share with me the slides. Um, so this is the upcoming events that we'll be having in the next two weeks. So uh, please be, be prepared for that. And one note is that on the demo day, you're, you're welcome to invite your friends or family or, or teachers to come and witness your presentation. So that's, that's from me, um, an announcement of upcoming events. And now I would like to give the floor to students again for any questions and answers. We have a few more minutes. So, Please feel free to ask your question. I see there was one from Isa. Uh, what are some of the mistakes or pitfalls to avoid when creating a pitch deck? Jeff, you want, you want to go or should I go? Oh, you're muted. So I'm, I'm going to go. You can oh, go. Here. You go. Yeah. So I, I do think the, the impulse or the, the need to tell the entire story instead of being very strategic about telling enough of a story to get them hooked and want to hear more. And it's uh, I've seen too many slides that are just every aspect of the business and just knowing what are the things that are going to hook them. I, I think putting in too much information is, is my main thing I've seen. I'll even support what Cal just said. We had one company um, in Eastern Europe that had a three minute pitch event. So they only had, as we like to say, they only had 180 seconds. That goes very, very quick. And they were very concerned about what slides to use. Should they have the financial forecast? Should they have the market size? Should they have you know, the value proposition, all the different slides? And we actually worked with them and very creatively, our objective again, as Cal noted earlier, is to create interest in what we have to say. So they ended up using zero slides. 
<laughs> and they were able to do a kind of a mock demo of their product in a very fun and compelling way. They they um they kind of demonstrated their product almost by accident. They switched from their mobile phone, had it switch up to the big screen behind them, and they pretended they didn't realize their phone was, you know, on the big screen and everyone could see it. And then they said, "Oh my gosh, didn't realize but that was actually a demo of our product. And they kind of surprised the audience in a way that was very memorable with zero slides. So it's not about slides to Cal's point. It's not about the amount of information you kind of shove into a slide. It's about telling a very interesting and compelling story so that you stand out in the minds of the audience. That's the objective here. If you stand out in a group of 10 or 20 companies, then someone at the end is going to come and talk to you. That's because you stuck in their mind. You, you made a memorable impact. So think about telling something that's just compelling and that you, you tell with confidence. People like confident people. So if you tell a good story with confidence, I think you guys will do very, very well. I'll throw out one more pitfall that I think I, I would strongly encourage you to focus on your call to action at the end, we call it. So we typically call that the ask. If you're preparing for investors, you ask for money at the end. That's a call to action. Sometimes if you're not ready to fundraise, people say, oh, well, I guess I won't have an, a call to action. But you have a captive audience that's listening to you. And I bet somebody in that audience could offer you something that would be mutually beneficial. So a call to action, if, if maybe you need an advisor, maybe you need an introduction, maybe you just want to have somebody listen to you. And with a call to action, just I'm ending now and I have something to ask of my audience. Even if it's just think about how bad traffic is, I'd love to get feedback and I'd love to do some market research. That could be a call to action. Never forget, ask something from your audience. They're listening to you, ask something. If I could even add one more, there was a there was a company we dealt with out of Spain. The gentleman had created a blood test. I know Cal's going to know one, yeah. exactly who I'm talking yeah. about. He created a blood test that was uh, the purpose was to detect cancers through a, a, a fairly non-invasive, just a small blood sample. And he started his presentation with like multiple charts. And these were like little charts that plotted data and he was showing like four different charts about the efficacy of other blood tests and then the efficacy of his blood test and i joked by the time he was done describing this that he had given me cancer it took him so long to tell me the story about his blood test idea it was just too long he couldn't get his point across so we asked him have you ever lost any loved one or a family member or, or known anybody who's had cancer? And he said, I had cancer, but I'm, I'm beyond it now. I'm, I'm healthy now. He said, my wife had cancer. He said, my cousin, my favorite cousin, I don't remember her name, but she passed from cancer. And so instead of all these charts with efficacy rates, we put up a photo of his cousin who, who passed away from cancer. And he introduced her. In the very beginning, he just said, by show of hands, that's another tool I would recommend. Maybe engage your audience. Ask by show of hands, how many of you fill in the blank? And maybe it's something you did. Um, you asked us earlier about exercise, exer gaming, right? Um, like the uh, Nintendo Switch game. You could say, how many of you exercise regularly? You raise your hand. When you raise your hand, the audience feels permissioned to raise their hand with you. So those that exercise will say, I do. Now you gained engagement. You're now having a conversation. You're not in the spotlight. You're just part of a conversation, right? So it's a nice way to get your nerves at ease by engaging the audience. But we, uh, this gentleman asked the audience how many have had cancer. And you can imagine or known somebody who's had cancer. Almost every hand go goes up. So immediately he engaged everyone in the room. And then he shows a photo of his cousin. I think her name was Marianne, let's say. And he says, this is my cousin, Marion. And he says, She's, she was my favorite cousin growing up. We were like brothers and sisters, brother and sister. But unfortunately, she passed away from late stage diagnosed breast cancer. And imagine if there was a way they could have diagnosed that earlier. And she could be sitting in this room with us right now, had they been able to uh, diagnose it earlier and treat it. But it didn't happen for her. Let me tell you about a blood test we have that allows for early diagnosis of blood cancers. 
It's a very compelling and an emotional way of engaging. And by the time he had already got everyone in the room to raise their hand saying, yes, I know somebody or, or who had cancer, everyone wanted to hear what he had to say. It was a, all he had was one photo, just a photo of his cousin, no words on the slide. So think about using these graphics in a way to inspire emotional response and also that kind of by show of hands, how many of you engage your audience very early on, it'll really ease your nerves. I think when you see those hands go up, you kind of get a little bit less nervous because you realize people are working with you. I hope that helps. Long example, but I hope it helps. So wonderful. Yeah, now we have yeah. a good beginning. We have a good ending of the presentation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Carl. Thank been... you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think we can take one more question if there's any. Uh, I, I understand that we're running out of time. So if we have any question, one last one. I also put the feedback survey in the chat box. So please take some time to fill the feedback survey. It seems that we're good. I'm not Is seeing there... any new questions. Well, we would just like to thank you guys. We wish you all amazing luck this week as you prepare for your pitch, uh, your pitches for your demo day. I'm sure they're going to come out great. You have great guides um, from the folks that, you, that are kind of running your program here. And hopefully some of the materials we've shared will inspire a little bit of uh, opportunity as well. So best of luck to everybody. And thank you guys so much for letting us share our time with you as well. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and good luck. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Carl, Jim. And thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for engaging with us. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Thank for you. attending bye -bye. the session. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.